What's up, everybody? Welcome to Gojo and Golik. Mike Golik Jr., Mike Golik Sr., Emerson Lazio holding it down in the DraftKings studio in Boston for us right now, which means we've got a great show coming up for you guys. As always, download, subscribe, rate, review it. Leave us a five-star rating and check us out here live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern on the DraftKings Network, noon to 1 p.m. Eastern, wherever you hear VSIN on the radio. Strap in today, folks. Emerson, what do we got coming up on the show? All right, big man. We're getting weird. We're getting odd in the NBA. Oddballs, Amin El Hassan will join the show. I believe it's going to be in studio, according to my source. Uh, pitching in, former MLB pitcher Rob Dibble weighing in on the smorgasbord of pitching injuries and no buts about it. <laughs> UFL weekend. We got a week three preview with the one, the only, Jake but, but gentlemen, where we will start this show, O.J. Simpson, the once beloved NFL superstar and Hollywood actor who was acquitted in a 1995 murder trial that gripped the nation, died at his Las Vegas home on Wednesday. He was 76. So Simpson, whose fame, fortune, and legacy were forever changed despite being cleared by an L.A. jury of killing his ex-wife and her friend Ron Goldman in what was dubbed the trial of the century, had been battling prostate cancer. Weird life, weird legacy for sure. Senior, you're a little bit on the older side here, so what do you remember about where you were on the night of the Bronco chase and on the day of the verdict? So that's October 3rd, 1995. Take us there right now. Yeah, the, the, the crossover to my career and the OJ situation was uh, I was pretty close to it. You know, the my last year in the NFL was 1993 with the Miami Dolphins. And at that point, OJ was a sideline reporter for NBC. And he actually did a couple of my games. I talked to him a few times. You know, when you talk to, as you know, Mike, when you do games, you talk to the analysts and the reporters. Did the game, uh, the Cleveland, my Cleveland Dolphin game in Cleveland. And I believe the uh, the game on Thanksgiving uh, in my in in Dallas. So I saw him and listen. That was literally months before the murders in June. This was in '93, so before the murders in June of '94. And at that point in June of '94, I wasn't on a team, but I was running and trying to prepare. But I certainly had a lot of time. I wasn't in an off season program, so you know I was I was at home. Uh, with my wife, with Chris, when the chase was going on. And then we got to the trial in November. I had run for a couple of teams, but I wasn't signed by anybody. So again, just kind of hanging out. And then as we went into 95, you know, we went into the trial in the 95. I think it went till October 95. That's when I got into the sports broadcasting and sports media. So I went from seeing him as a player to now while I was doing college games for ESPN, I was doing radio actually out here in Arizona, morning radio. And of course, the topic du jour was OJ Simpson. So that's what we were talking about, you know, at, at all times was OJ. It's, it's, I mean, my God, it probably started reality TV with this trial. So I'm on a CNN called yesterday and asked me to do a hit for them about it. And on that, 
uh, same interview was Bob Costas, the great Bob Costas. I had never heard this story, guys. And I was sitting there amazed when he was telling it. So he said when they asked Bob about the situation <clears throat> and the 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 uh, slow car chase with Al Collins driving the white Bronco was in June. That was during the NBA playoffs. Bob Costas calls the NBA playoff games for NBC. OJ from the white Bronco was trying to call Bob Costas. He was trying to call him at home because Bob didn't have a cell phone. This is just when cell phones were, <clears throat> were coming out. And I think OJ was actually using one of those old brick car phones. He was trying to call Bob Costas at home. Bob obviously wasn't there. And since OJ worked for NBC, he got the number to the truck, the transmission truck at the game Bob Costas was doing. He called the truck and talked to somebody in the truck. And they said, I got, and OJ said, I got to talk to Bob Costas. And the guy's like, he's getting ready to do a game. He's not here. And he said, no, I got to talk to him now. And he said, he's not here. And, th and then the guy said, who is this? And OJ said, it's OJ Simpson. And the guy said, yeah, right. And hung up on, hung up on OJ when he was in the white Bronco because <laughs> he thought it was a joke and never, and never told Bob about it. Right. So then Bob, then OJ gets arrested in November of 94, and he's in jail, and OJ had Bob come to the jail. It was Bob Costas, Al Collins, and, and Kardashian, the, one of the lawyers. Those are the only three visiting OJ at the jail. And, and OJ said, I tried to call you, and Bob's like, well, you know, uh, whatever. You know, I, I never got the message. I had no idea. Why were you trying to call me? And OJ said to him, I was being defamed, and I wanted you you since you're a friend of mine to kind of you know have my honor here you know and 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 he said not really about the situation but about my entire life and football and everything and and bob on the interview yesterday bob said well oj i i, I wouldn't have had been able to you know do that i would have had to ask you some questions and then of course the the right thing to do the cnn interviewer yesterday said well what would you have asked him and he said, I would have tried to find the best way I could have asked him of, did you do this? And he goes, I would have expected him to say no. And if he said no, I think I, Bob Costa said, I would have asked him, well, <clears throat> innocent people don't normally write suicide notes and innocent people don't have a gun and are threatening to kill themselves. So he was like, you know, I'm not really sure what I was going to believe here. But that was that was the interaction. So. OJ was actually on the phone in the Bronco in that slow chase trying to call Bob Costas. That was amazing to me uh, to hear. But listen, I mean, and, and on Twitter, you knew this obviously blew up on Twitter yesterday. Mike and I, and I read tweets about leave the man be, you know, just worry about his family, let him rest in peace. And, and my thought was it, it can't happen that way. This when you say OJ Simpson before his football career, you're going to say, Bronco chase and murders. I mean, that's what you're going to say. So as, as I said in the interview yesterday, that you can't separate those. Everybody has an opinion. I have the opinion. I think he did it. A lot of people have the opinion of that. And there are those that said, hey, he got acquitted. So, you know, we, we don't think he did it. But it's never going to leave. It's going to be one of the first things after the O.J. Simpson comma, what said next. Um, but, but man, like I was amazed at that Bob Costa story. That was unreal. I, I think that story underscores, though, what a insane cultural phenomenon, what a moment in time that was. That Because coming off the top here, listening to Emerson, list all that stuff, you're coming on the show and trying to figure out today, how do you go about tackling a subject like this? What you said, Dad, O.J. Simpson largely, largely going to be viewed as someone everyone believes got away with murder and also was a prolific football player and in this day and age had been still very out in the open making content openly in the face of all these people that felt this type of way about oj simpson but like how do you explain that to a generation now that's come up without this you know we had the oj made in america documentary on espn which man if you hadn't watched it already now would be a great time to go back and watch what could be one of the best modern sports documentaries 
series or documentaries of any kind that kind of underscores this. But, Dad, I, I think people who weren't alive for that moment trying to digest what you just described of, oh, no, we were all trained around watching this happen in real time. Also, because of the fact that when this happened, like, Dad, I think the hardest thing for people to understand also is – what O.J. Simpson represented as a football player and as a star <clears throat> in America at that point because of his football exploits. And that thought, I thought what the documentary did a really good job of was making you understand how transcendent <clears throat> O.J. was at that time as a football player and as a star, and then for this to be the thing that derail, you know, he derailed his life with. I mean, and, and remember, he obviously was acquitted on this for the, the unbelievable scene of, you know, if it don't fit, you you have to acquit, you know, of, of having to try on a tight glove anyway over a rubber glove, like a surgical glove. I mean, that just kind of blew up the case there. Um, and, and and I don't think even though even still a lot of people weren't don't remember this a whole lot or were young is he got acquitted of that, but ended up still going to jail for armed robbery and kidnapping in Las Vegas. Or we thought some people had some of his memorabilia that they shouldn't have had it. So he went and tried to steal it back from these people and actually got, went to prison for that. I mean, so, it, and then listen, the trial, like I said, I think was the start of reality TV. You, you remember all the characters, judge Ito with all the different clocks, you know, that were on, you know, on his, on or his desk where he was. Uh, I mean, it, everybody became, a star in their own way. And oddly enough, every person, every attorney on the defense team for OJ has passed away from cancer. They're all gone. Every one of them has passed away. OJ was the last one and all from cancer. This, this was, like I said, reality TV. This was all individual stars. This was following every person on the prosecution team, the defense team, the judge after this trial of what they were doing, of where they went. This was this was the biggest thing, and it lasted. The trial started in what November of ninety four, and I think went till October yep. of ninety five. So it lasted a long time, and this was, I mean, every single day you were riveted, riveted to the TV, just listening to the mounds and mounds of evidence and questions and and and, and witnesses. It was it was incredible. It really was, and I mean, listen. Because you separate, if you can separate, this guy was one of the great football players there was. I mean, he was an unbelievable football player. Went on to the acting career, all the commercials that he's done as well. But again, this is this is the first thing you'll obviously remember about him. Uh, and, and listen, it's still going on. He he did lose in civil court to the Goldmans to the tune of thirty three million dollars in a wrongful death. The Goldmans have gotten maybe a hundred some thousand of that. And it accrues over the years when the payout isn't around. So that 30 hasn't happened. So that 33 million today is up to around $96 million that is owed to them. And, and who knows if they'll ever see a penny. I mean, we see people, other people who lose civil suits and have to pay money and find a way. He moved to Florida where the laws are a little better to, to be able to quote unquote, hide your money. So, I mean, there's there's still ancillary things going on uh, with this. There are. And I wonder now, like I, like you said, though, how much of that even continues at this point? Because, again, this has always been the same thing it drew back to. Every time you saw OJ in public, every time you saw him on a podcast or going on Twitter, which he had become really well known for in the recent years, it just immediately went back to this source. And what you're describing now, and I think the circumstances around the reaction to his death yesterday, Bamani Jones put it best. We kind of got to find out what it would have been like to have Twitter when all that stuff went down because everyone was oh. just getting out the things they thought then. You're right. There was, I, I shouldn't say not any morning. There was some very strange stuff. I mean, the Heisman Trust putting out the tweet mourning the loss of O.J. Simpson, just underscoring the ridiculous nature that Reggie Bush currently doesn't have a Heisman right now because he lived yeah. in the wrong house while he was at USC. But this man was accused of literal murder and somehow still allowed to keep his Heisman and is someone that they would honor after his death in that way is wild to see. There were a bunch of young, I saw Todd Gurley had a tweet glowingly <clears throat> praising OJ Simpson in ways that just don't make sense and seem to largely ignore. Like you can, 
I understand that if you're someone that had a personal relationship with this person, maybe today can be a little bit different. But man, I do feel like there's still a level of read the room that has to go on because <clears> this person's larger than life, Dad. This person represents something that's bigger than anyone's relationship with them. And I think that's why, to some people, this reaction might have felt callous. But for a lot of people, that felt earned. You know, I, it, Mike, it's tough for me to to get on anybody because because it, it did seem wild. Like I read, you saw the Todd Gurley tweet and others, but but these guys are young, right? Like you, you you were a kid yeah. when this was all going on. I, I you can't ask them to. They're not going to go back and watch all this, rewatch it, or maybe read. I mean, the amount you could read on it, they just see a guy. Who and, and and I'm not saying this in a, in a bad way to them, but there are those who are younger that see a guy, understand, wow, look what happened here with this chase. He was uh, accused of murder, and oh by the way, he was acquitted. So there are people who don't weren't around for this situation, don't don't didn't see everything going on, could form their opinion based on all of that. Like I gave mine, and can just say, well, this guy was accused of murder, he was acquitted, so obviously. He was innocent. So now, you know, I'm going to mourn the football player, you know, and, and his family. So it, it's tough for me to really get on anybody. Uh, and, and listen, everybody has their own opinion. They're, they're allowed to. And there may be. I'm sure there's people who knew the whole situation and still, you know, say, hey, he was acquitted. He didn't do it. Leave the man alone. But certainly a younger generation who wasn't around for any of this and only kind of see the headlines accused of murder, Bronco Chase acquitted. Uh, of that, you know, I, I can see how they would maybe just go to the football side and say, you know, great football player, great loss. There were two trials like when I was growing up. I was around 10, 11 at the time. I remember it was appointment television in my household. We'd sit around the table, the dinner table. We'd flip on and we would watch Deborah Norville on Inside Edition. And it was the Nancy Kerrigan trial. And then it was also the O.J. Simpson trial. Seriously, Every single night, my sister and I and my parents would sit around and eat twice baked potatoes and we'd dial into this television program to get caught up on everything that's happened. Like we were glued to our TV every night and I'm 10 and 11. I don't understand a single thing. I'm like, isn't this the football player? Like I don't quite, I couldn't wrap my mind around what I was watching. Yeah, I, and I think to that point, Emerson, and to Dad's point, you're right. There are a lot of people that maybe can't fully comprehend this because they were either young when it happened or they were so young that they weren't alive when it happened. But I think if you have digested anything related to OJ, then if you're a person coming from that way, I don't know how the, the headline isn't anything other than man who got away with murder mm -hmm. and also played football passes <laughs> away. That seems to be like... I. O.J. Simpson largely seemed like a flawed, a flawed person who was linked to this incredibly heinous crime and trial. And oh, by the way, he played football. Like, Dad, that to me, the football's the throwaway, regardless of how great he was. Yeah. It's just so far down on the list of things that I perceive when I think about O.J. Simpson and I think about what his legacy is now as he has passed away. Yeah, that's the other thing, too, because his football career ended so long ago as well, right? Uh, and, and people really, really had to go back and, and see, okay, what, wait, what kind of football player was he, you know, for those that didn't know a lot about him and then saw the start of this trial and, and dove into it a little bit and had to look back and see what kind of player he was. He's a great player. He's a great player at USC. He's a great player, uh, for, you know, his career the, with the Buffalo Bills. And, but that, that, that is going to get lost because certainly this was the, one of the biggest things ever. And, and like I said, after the come after his name, the, the trial and the Bronco chase are going to be first. And that's understandable. I get it. Um, but, but again, different generations are going to see this differently. It was one of the, I mean, we'd say most complicated lives out there it was a great life for a while. Dude had everything he wanted. He was, I mean, when you're a star in California, I mean, like he was at USC, before he even got to the NFL, and then he's in movies as well. I mean, this guy was about as big as could be, right? What a place to be a star in California at, at that time. And then, I mean, to have it go all the other way, the way it did, and again, have most people like myself, I don't know what you guys think, who did, do, do think he did it. Uh, it. It's just, it's an incredible, incredible life that it is interesting now to kind of step back 
uh, because I know how involved I was with it and watching and being around it at that time. But to see how other people are digesting it, whether they're older than me, same age as me, a little bit younger than me or way younger than me of how they all see the situation. I think the the thing that I take away from it is that I do believe based on what I saw that he was guilty, that he was acquitted of a crime that he did commit, but then also went about his freedom in a way that almost seemed to throw it in everybody's face. You'd think someone in that yeah. position might shy away, might go back into themselves. And instead OJ decided, no, he was going to live just as loud as he wanted to, despite everything else that had happened in a way that felt defiant. And I think made a lot of people continually uncomfortable right up until the end. So uh, an incredibly complicated legacy for one of the most polarizing figures in modern American history. Check this out. After being turned down by the latest top tier head coach, so that's Baylor Scott Drew, Kentucky basketball reportedly closing in on one of its own to take over the program. No, not like the first or second, third, fourth, maybe not even the fifth choice. Wildcats are finalizing a five-year deal with BYU's Mark Pope. Sources telling ESPN on Thursday, so he played two seasons at Kentucky, won a national title there, Gojo. He's taken BYU to a couple NCAA tournaments in his five years at the helm. But again, this poor guy, I mean, the money on the contract, that will definitely help you forget the fact that you weren't their first choice. Maybe not even their fourth or fifth here. So I think the interesting part about this dad for the reception isn't going to be, oh, that he was the fourth or fifth choice. Like, that's that's showbiz. He understands that getting into coaching and right. someone who came up in athletics, you're not always going to be that, but you're going to be ready for any opportunity. I would be curious, Dad, if the part that stings is going to be what I think is going to be a largely tepid reception from Big Blue Nation, who seemed to be in shambles yesterday, watching this incredibly proud Blue Blood basketball program get turned down by coach after coach for a job that they 
they all believe is great. And now one of their own sons is coming back to coach and nobody seems excited about it. And that part has to suck if you're going back to coach at your alma mater. Well, yeah, it does. From both sides of this first Kentucky nation, you would think you're still one of those that, that it's an, a, you know, a job that, that p- coaches are going to want. You keep, you got turned down for them. So that part of it, you feel snubbed a bit. Uh, but for him, I mean, you're right, Mark, Mike, we, we, we've seen this, you know, this isn't the first time a first or second or third choice has turned it down. He's going to the fourth, fifth or lower choice to get there. But coaches have the confidence in the fact that obviously he played there and that they can build the program. The, to me, one of the problems is going to be the opposite of where what Calipari is going to face in Arkansas. He's going to Arkansas with a clean slate, with a billionaire behind him uh, who gave him a lot of money and is going to give, you know, the NIL is going to be stocked, you know, like, like the Christmas stockings, you know, and they're going to be able to go out and get players. And Cal has a reputation and is going to be able to get players. I don't know what's going to happen here. Cal was already kind of complaining a bit that maybe the support was waning in Kentucky as far as that stuff was concerned. So how much is this new guy going to get? You know, even though we played there, is there going to be the, oh, yeah, let's fill the coffers so he can go get the players? So that's my concern. The coach and having the ability, we talk about this in the NFL all the time. Coaches think they can make players better because that's what they do. They coach. So this coach is going to think I can go there and I can succeed. I have the the confidence in my abilities as a coach to make this succeed. But to do that, you're going to need some great players. And I wonder if that's going to be the issue of him being able to have them. They may say they want to come there, but can they get paid now in this era of free agency and college sports? So I think he's on obviously a different plane than Cal going to Arkansas. Yeah, I, I, oh, it's an entirely different thing because part of the thing for Kentucky and their retort to Cal, it seemed, when he was there was, well, you want all of this stuff resource-wise, but where have our wins been in this recent part of your tenure here? In the last few years of it, we haven't been going to Final Fours every year. We haven't won a national championship again, so why are we going to pony up all this money to support you like that? And now you're saying, all right, why would we do that for a guy that's won exactly zero tournament games so far? And I understand for Mark Pope, I saw plenty of people around college basketball who said, this man comes in well-regarded from an X's and O's standpoint. They played an exciting style of offense at BYU. There are all these things you can point to that would be positives from a coaching standpoint. But in terms of what you mentioned, that's the reality of modern college athletics is unless you're willing to pony up and do this, and now you're basically asking Kentucky to do this sight unseen based on faith, not by anything they've actually gotten as a tangible result, all while coping with the reality that you brought up, Dad, that I think is One of the most interesting moments of soul searching that happens in sports is when you figure out, oh, are we not what we perceive ourselves to be? Like that thing that came up for Notre Dame when when Brian Kelly left for LSU and Notre Dame fans had to reckon with, wait a minute, are we not the end destination for somebody anymore? That's sort of a come to Jesus moment for a fan base and an institution. Well, guys, he was all, he yeah, had a good nope. first year in the, in the Big 12. The problem is, no matter who was going to take this job, was going to have their work cut out for him because you had their star freshman declaring for the draft, multiple other dudes hitting the transfer portal, other recruits who have committed to Kentucky have since backed off of that their pledges uh, up to this point. So this is not going to be an easy transition for that program, that's for sure. No, it, it's not, and, and that stuff has happened. We have seen decommits when coaches have gone or, or, or players that will leave, some players will leave Kentucky maybe and go to Arkansas. But, Mike, to your point, I, I agree. There is that realization. We did have it at Notre Dame. We never had a coach leave and coach somewhere else. It was either they were fired or retired. And now Brian Kelly, you know, and, and he has, you know, it's his choice to do what he wants. He left because all that was missing in his resume, it was a national championship, and he felt he had a better chance year after year of getting it in uh, at LSU. So, yeah, that, that is a realization. And then when you see coaches turn it down and turn it down and turn it down. Uh, but to me, the big, biggest thing now is the, the, the administration, they have to back this guy, right? They, they have to. They, they can't say, well, we have to wait and see what you do. Well, to wait and see what we do, I, I got to do it with players. I, I got to do it with resources. So to to show you what I can do, I need the resources to do what I can do to show you what I can do. So kind of that domino effect that 
that administration has got to get on board with. Well, I think one of the interesting parts about this is what that support manifests itself and what Mark Pope's approach to this will be, because we talked about in this day and age, can you win as much with one undone talent doing it the way Cal did? We were talking about would he have needed to change his approach, even if he had stayed the way it looked like he was in line to after the season. And would Mark Pope coming in be in a position to where maybe it's all right, you're not going to get as much one and done town. Like I certainly don't think you're going to have the number one class year after year, like you did with Cal, just because that is so tied to him. Even if Kentucky itself is always going to be a draw, but now with that, would it come maybe, all right, a program that's more predicated on a little bit of stability, multi-year guys. And could that somehow in, in a weird roundabout way, get them closer to the result that they're looking for in this current landscape of college basketball. I don't know. That's probably a lot of spin to right. try and galaxy right. brain this into being a good decision. Yeah, that, that, that's exactly right. And we'll just have to wait and see, you know, I, I, again, you got guys that played at Kentucky for Cal now throwing their weight behind Cal at Arkansas. I mean, so guys yeah. that he played for, that played for him, I mean, that that had the year, the one year or whatever years at Kentucky following the coach, not the school. You know, and we, we've always talked about whenever, remember, they, they, they football, all athletes get told this. Don't go to the school for the coach. Well, hell, that's easier said than done. There are a hell of a lot of bat, and I'll stay with the two mains, basketball and football, that go somewhere because of the coach. Because the coach gets players here or there or there or to the next level. And that's what they want to see. So that's an interesting part as well as players who played for this coach in Calipari are now following him to Arkansas. That's, that's another kind of a damning thing. If you're a Kentucky fan, I was going to say the real nightmare scenario for Kentucky is seeing some of those guys that were in your uniform that love your university but have also always been linked to Cal. Like, that's the one thing you see Cal all the time at NBA games supporting the guys that played for him. There is a very public and overt idea of maintaining those relationships. And the first time you see one of those guys show up in an Arkansas practice draped in that Cardinal with the hog on their chest, I'd imagine that's going to be a shot to the heart for a lot of people because, Dad, to your point, yeah. players are extremely loyal if it's a coach that they love who they believe has done right by them. And by all accounts, it seems like these players do have a good relationship with with John Calipari and you certainly love your alma mater still, but you're right. I mean, John Calipari is the guy that I'm sure a lot of them look at and say, helped make me a life changing sum of money in the NBA. So why wouldn't I continue to support him? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Completely agree. So, you know, new guy, tough, tough go, right? I mean, he's excited and he should be, he gets to go coach at his alma mater. Listen, a lot of these a lot of these coaches love to go back to their schools and coach. He gets the chance, certainly uh, from a reputational standpoint of the two schools, it's a monster step up. Uh, but, you know, it could be to be careful what you wish for. Let's let's see how it all goes and let's see if you can last there for a little while and build something. And hopefully, like I said, he gets help from the administration. A new pope in Kentucky <laughs> getting ready to lead the charge. I've wanted to say that all morning. Yeah.
Welcome back to Gojo and Golok. Mike Golok Jr., Mike Golok Sr., and Emerson Lazio. We're having a morning around here. We're excited. Amin El Hassan is going to be joining Emerson in studio in Boston. Him and Charlotte from Oddball are both out in Boston this week, so that's awesome. We're excited to talk some NBA action with him. We have a ton of games, by the way, coming up tonight. It feels like everyone plays tonight, and then obviously Sunday, the last game of the regular season that'll mark it for everybody, but lots still at stake there. We can get it, take stock of the postseason with him. Jake Butt, who's coming on later also, the former Michigan tight end. He's on the call for these UFL games now, which is exciting, but certainly want to talk with him about you know J.J. McCarthy and the rise that he's had this spring, what Jim Harbaugh is doing at the next level already in the future at his alma mater at Michigan, but we've also got problems to contend with right now because my dad is in a house without any Wi-Fi this morning and is over there, a man alone on an island, trying to negotiate with a whole bunch of technology that is just betraying him left and right, all while we're talking, trying to talk about like O.J. Simpson yeah. dying and Kentucky naming a new coach. We're getting ready to talk about uh, Shohei Itani's translator being accused of an insane level of fraud with multi-million dollars, and my dad's over here basically on bootleg cell service in the desert. <laughs> yeah, just know I, I got the AirPod in. It just popped up. I got 5% left. That's going to go out in a minute. I tried to connect these headphones to the phone. <clears throat> and when you start it, it tells you what it's connected to. I swear it said it's connected to every single device I have in this house, except for my phone. So that didn't work. So just know in a couple of minutes, all of a sudden it's going to be the speaker or the phone. And yeah. This is your mother is trying her damnedest to help because <laughs> I'm of I'm of I'm of no use at all in this situation. I just imagine. Remember the See, video. This is the, the, go, ahead. go ahead. Go ahead. This is the old parable of teach him. You know, the give a man a fish. You feed him for a day, teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. My dad, when it comes to technology, has decided he just wants to be given fish. He has never once yes. displayed an aptitude to want to learn how to fish when it comes to this. And so now you're in this boat starving because at every turn when we've tried to help teach you something, you decided that you didn't want to do it. And so now you're in this situation where nobody can help you and you can't help yourself. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I'm not only starving, there's a hole in the boat. I mean, that, oh that's my God. where we that's, are. That's a story in the Bible. Jesus like, is yeah. like, yo, yeah. bros, cast the net. Except it's you in the boat that's sinking. You cast the net. You pull it in. Jesus is like, just kidding, bro. Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's incredible. So dad's taking on water right now currently <laughs> inside the boat. It's the Titanic. Uh, as we've got a... Yeah. It's... It's it's a lot. We're yeah. We're crossing a lot of metaphors right now. Mercifully, we're getting some help right now here as we've got Major League Baseball to talk about here. Rob Dibble, kind enough to join us, former Major League pitcher, host of the Rob Dibble Show on Fox Sports Radio, uh, our old teammate at ESPN. Rob, thank you for the time this morning. My dad's really struggling, so he needed your help today. Guys, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. Oh, <laughs> uh, thanks, Dib. You're, you're saving me here, but but help us as well because Mike and I were talking about the the elbow injuries, the Tommy John surgeries of the, of the baseball players, not only in Major League, but starting at a young age. But but let's focus first on Major League Baseball. The union trying to say we need to look at the pitch clock. The league saying, hey, we had a study from John Hopkins that it wasn't the pitch clock. Where, where are we and what do you think is going on? Well, you, you can't say it's not the pitch clock. It's only been there for two years. Um, but I've been researching this for 25 years with – the best orthopedic surgeons in the business well before this rash of injuries because I've been working with high school pitchers for the last 20 years and I still coach 15U and 16U AAU. We go to a ton of tournaments and stuff like that. And everybody on my team pitches, by the way, um, because when we go to a tournament, we'll play five games in one weekend. So everybody, even if you have to contribute an inning, I don't let my pitchers go by a certain you know pitch count because there's certain things that I factor in. And it, it's it's your warm ups, like your long tossing before the game. You're in the bullpen warming up. I count all of those pitches because now let's take a major league guy. Major league guys, you know, you're you're doing your warm up. You're doing 30, 30 long tosses, fifty in the bullpen. You're already at eighty. You've already thrown eighty throws. Now you get in the game, and these guys throw a hundred max effort pitches by the fifth inning. You're at two. You're at about two hundred for that day. That's a lot. If you listen to Dr. Andrews and I talk to all these guys, 
Um, I'll give you an example. Dr. Craig Morgan out of Maryland, who did Kurt Schilling's <laughs> surgery years ago, um, and many, many other big leaguers. He did a 20-year study, and of 300 Tommy John recipients, all 300 had loose scapulas. So that's that's where you start. You start with the shoulder, you get to the elbow, and, and you know, you, you've got a lot of problems. And so then you've got all these velocity camps out there and ranches, and you've got 12 to 15-year-old kids thinking, I need to throw 90 miles an hour by the time I'm 17 years old. That's insane. When I was in high school, I maxed out around 90. As I, you know, and, and you guys know this as well as I do because I've been studying this stuff since I retired. Your growth plates in your arm don't finish developing till you're in your 20s. And Dr. James Andrews just came out and said this. And so if, if you're going to lift weights, if you're going to have like those stupid water things or throwing a 25 pound medicine ball over your shoulder, you're destroying the growth plates in your arm. And now your ligament has to pick up all the, all the uh, excess weight and it can't handle it it's just a little ligament you've got you you've got little ligaments in your shoulder and your labrum i i ruptured my labrum that's what ended my career so you know you you put all of those things together and you know then we don't allow recovery time i i don't want my kids to play 10 months a year as a major leaguer i played six months a year so you've got kids playing nine ten months they they never have time to recover so you know, you guys didn't play football 10 months a year. NFL guys didn't play 10 months a year. You, you'd explode. So I, I just think that, you know, there's so many different factors in here. The pitch clock is like the last thing I, I think about when I'm thinking about. That's just a bell and whistle for Rob Manfred. You know, let, let's big bigger bases, uh, no, no contact at second or home, uh, you know, pitch clocks, all these different ridiculous things. It, that's not going to stop these elbow injuries. The elbow injuries – are, are really the last 20 years of everybody trying to throw 100 miles an hour and all of this other stuff that you throw in there. So, Rob, with that in mind, and we've only got a couple of minutes left here, is there any way to put the toothpaste back in the tube on that? Like, what would you – I know you're doing it personally, but is there anything that could be done broadly to help start to curb this? Absolutely. I mean, first, uh, with bullpens. You know, with my 15 and 16 year – when I threw a bullpen, I was just hitting locations. My, my whole, you know, as 13 years as a professional and eight in the major leagues, you're just you're not throwing max effort. You're just hitting spots. The best pitchers I ever saw were the Tommy Johns, the Don Suttons, the Gaylord Perrys, um, you know, Jamie Moyer. Guy, guys that were spot pitchers are the best in my mind. A lot of guys could throw 100. That's not pitching. That's throwing. That, that's like it's a carnival act. You know, I was watching the Red Sox game last night. And here's another. Here's the last thing I'll, I'll say because I know we don't have a lot of time. The last 20 years, even high school pitchers, they throw 60 to 70 percent off-speed stuff and 30 percent fastballs. When I played in the major leagues, I threw 90 percent fastballs and 10 percent breaking balls. Watch any major league game, and Garrett Cole, Scherzer are very. Those are some of the few guys that still throw 70, 80 percent fastballs. Every other major league starting pitcher is going to throw 60 or 70%. And we're talking circle changes, 90 miles an hour. That's absurd. A circle change is supposed to be 80. You know, a, a curveball is supposed to be in the 80 mile an hour range, 85 miles an hour. Everybody wants to throw 90, 95, 100 with, and I've done, listen, I do the rap soto, I do the, the spin rates and all of that stuff, uh, the, the gyro spin. I know all of that stuff. And, and all of this is creating a mindset that I have to throw every pitch 100%. That's absurd. When you throw a bullpen, you throw it about 60 to 70%. You know, when you warm up for a game, 60, 70%. You don't get to max effort till you're facing your first live hitter. It's fascinating, and we could listen to you talk all day about this. It's incredibly helpful. We appreciate all this time and insight, Rob. Thank you, and hopefully there can be more done so that we don't see so many of the great stars of today sidelined with more and more of these surgeries. Get Tom House on. He's the best. Tom Brady was a client. Nolan Ryan was a client. Tom, Tom House is the foremost best pitching coach out there.
right, Gojo, you thought you were bad at betting. Shohei Otani's ex-interpreter, Ipe Mizuhara, lost more than $40 million through sports betting over a 26-month span, according to a bombshell criminal complaint released by federal prosecutors yesterday. Worst sports better who ever lived was charged with federal bank fraud after being accused of stealing more than $16 million from Otani to cover gambling debts here. So Gojo in total, he won just north of $142 million, but lost $182 million through the illegal bookmaker who is uh, $40 million richer now. What do you think? There was a $10 bet in there as well. Everyone's like, what was the $10 bet? <laughs> I know everyone looking at the stats that yeah. came out of this front office sports was the account that tweeted it. The average wager for ePay was about $12,800. The largest wager, 1,000 or excuse me, $160,000. And the smallest wager was $10. And yeah, everyone looking for this much volume and this many bets per day, what possibly he could have thrown $10 on. There were also people, because in this large extensive report that was released, there was a few interesting things that came out of actual substance, like the fact that there's still no evidence that there was any money or any bets placed on Major League Baseball at this point, which whatever part of the story you believe at this point concerning Shohei's involvement in this or not, there were text messages exchanged between between the bookmaker and between Ipe, where the bookmaker tries to say, you know, Ipe, after the original article comes out, text this bookmaker and the bookmaker says, oh, well, this is, you know, clearly we can see this is a cover up and you're taking the fall. And the, the Ipe tries to say, oh, no, well, I actually did steal from him. It's over for me. However you think that sounds and that lands for you, dad, at the end of the day, the main factor seems to still be pointing back to as long as there was no money wagered on Major League Baseball, we're avoiding the worst case scenario in this entire ordeal. And that's really, I think, all anyone, Rob Manfred or otherwise in the league office cares about. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree. Listen, the gambling is illegal in California. So from that side of it, it was wrong. You're working with an illegal bookmaker. Uh, that That is wrong. But you're right. It wasn't on your sport because now as gambling is becoming legal, we can see you can do it on other sports, uh, just like like we talked about in baseball, but just not on baseball. I don't think Shohei is going to be in any trouble here, wherever this investigation goes. However you want to look at it, I'm sure there are going to be people we know, Mike, that are going to think Shohei has a fall guy here, right? And that he's going to take care of him and that Shohei was actually in on this, which which would blow my mind. Uh, given, given, you know, the money the guy makes. Uh, so I, I, I don't know obviously enough about this situation, but it does seem that Shoei is not going to be in any trouble at all in this. Mm. And this is just at some point going to go away and it's going to be the interpreter getting into whatever trouble he's going to get into. That seems to be where this is centered on because you're right. Again, this all goes back to a subject that because we know so little about Sheho Shohei Atani, we have a really hard time grappling with what we might actually think this person could be capable of or what could happen in his situation because so much of what's gone on with him has been kept behind this gate his entire career. That's all his personal information, let alone how he would deal in something like this who for anyone, again, that might have missed this at the beginning, Ipe Mizuhara is a guy that Shohei's known since he was a young man getting into all this. He's 10 years his senior. They've been described as incredibly close friends in addition to the business relationship that they have. And so this guy having access to his accounts, this guy apparently now investigators saying through phone records that they've got Mizuhara falsely identifying himself as Otani to trick bank employers into authorizing transfer, all this stuff that big time illegal, regardless of what their relationship yeah, is yeah. and sounds like will absolutely be the thing that brings him down still doesn't do anything. I think to clarify the nature of the relationship and the truth at the center of this for some people, but dad, the mountain of evidence that we've got now just seems to support that. Yes, this guy seems like he's going to go to jail or have at least some punishment levied for all of this. And Shohei Itani is going to be allowed to keep playing baseball, but dad, not without, I think this certain cloud always associated with him, even if it's not the first thing that we're going to bring up even months from now, if the Dodgers keep going on the pace that they've started this season at. It's, it's not, you're right. This is going to become kind of an but this is going to be kind of, oh, yeah, Shohei was involved, you know, in this situation. Um, and, you know, he, he 
it's going to turn out. He's, I, I don't think he's going to get in trouble. So yeah, just like it, it, it's, it's not going to be the main thing you talk about with Shoei. It's going to be an afterthought on him. I, I think eventually and to, and to Rob Manfred and baseball's, I'm sure joy, that's how it's going to end up. Because when this first came out, I mean, my God, the guy who signs the biggest contract of all time. And then all of a sudden is the headline for a betting scandal could, could not be worse for the, the game. We're talking about the integrity of the game. I mean, that what a bombshell that day that had to be for Rob Manfred and baseball. But I, it, to me, I think there's no doubt that they're going to they're going to escape this. Well, in eBay's defense here, one of his alleged texts to the bookies, he says, I'm terrible at the sports betting thing. Huh? LOL. <laughs> like what an all time quote and a new meme that absolutely went platinum yesterday on Twitter. Well, between that and then the text message exchange where uh, he talks about He's been messing around with soccer because, again, the focus of this was what sports was he betting yeah. on? What was going on here? And as long as it wasn't baseball, Dad, I'm with you. Technically, in the Major League Baseball you know, Players Association, their collective bargaining agreement, if you're doing any dealings with an illegal bookmaker or if you're betting on baseball, you in their eyes are guilty of something that would warrant punishment. And so while that was here morally and the ways that we're worried about this existentially for the sport – if it was even Shohei Itani betting with an illegal bookmaker, but not betting on baseball, I think for most right. of us, that's something where it's like, all right, you're an adult. That's your money. You make a ton of it. And so if you're comfortable with that, then as long as you're not betting on Major League Baseball, I, I kind of am going to throw my hands up and go, all right, that's the way the news goes. But in this, as that subject was all the way around it, we had the text message exchange where Ipe says, quote, I've been messing around with soccer. There's games on 24-7, LOL. I took UCLA, but they lost outright. People actually went back and looked and noted that when these text messages were sent in 2021, UCLA soccer was on a tear and wasn't losing games then. And they actually think he was referencing the UCLA and Fresno State banger of a game where Jake Hayner, one of my favorite college quarterbacks in recent memory, went off for three, four hundred. 155 yards in a game where they came back and won 40 to 37. So at the very least, we know he had great taste and content because we were all dialed in on that game and it was awesome. <laughs> it was. Listen, uh, th this guy's going to be forgetting the gambling part of it. I mean, to go into now, listen, Shoei may not press charges. That doesn't mean nothing's going to happen to him because they have all this evidence against him. You know, they could still obviously oh. go after him, but you wonder if. You wonder if Shoei is going to do th things now to help him because they were longtime friends. And you, you just wonder where that's going to go. I, I don't think it's going to help the interpreter in the long run with the mounds of evidence against him. But, you know, a lot of times you have someone that goes after him and said, I'm pressing charges. Hit him with the, everything you can. You know, I don't know if Shoei is going to do that. I do still going to be obviously in a lot of trouble, but it'll be interesting to see where it goes. But clearly, not the headline that's going to worry baseball anymore. Yeah, once the feds get involved, you've got a lot mm -hmm. to worry yeah. about. And so yeah. with yeah. that being yeah. the source of this and the bank fraud he's accused of by the feds, or I should say a complaint accusing ePay of bank fraud, carries a max fine of up to a million dollars and or up to 30 years in prison, according to federal sentencing guidelines. There's a long way to go between then and now. And yeah, Dad, I will be fascinated for the people that thought that this might be a situation of a Fall Guys situation. Would he be taken care of? Or just, you're right from the relationship standpoint, what this looks like going forward, as I'd imagine it's probably in Shohei's best interest, no matter his level of you know perceived guilt or not, if at this point we're just going to operate under what we have evidence-wise. Shohei Atani has so far been absolved of any wrongdoing in this situation and looks like he will continue to be. And if you were someone else advising him now, it would be in his best interest to no longer associate with this person who's right. been tied to the one headline that could stain an otherwise incredibly already successful career and one that shows even more promise now going forward as he got paid the King's ransom, as the Dodgers are the team to beat in Major League Baseball as well. Yeah, I'm sure. And part of Shohei may say, listen, to me, that was, the money he stole was like somebody finding change in their sofa, so no big deal. <laughs> yeah, it must Stop be nice. It. Stop <laughs> it. Stop <laughs> it.
is the wild, wild west behind the scenes here today with, <laughs> with Mr. G and his pods and his headphones. Speaking of the wild west, man, what's cooking in the NBA? I don't know. I think the east and the west are going to come down the last day of the regular season. Everyone says, oh, well, when's that? That's Sunday, actually. So, like, speaking of last night, let's talk about the Pelicans beating the Kings here just really quick. Zion leaves the game with a wrist injury in the first half, comes back, scores 23 of his 31 in the second half. So, with the loss, Kings are now locked into the play-in tournament here. Uh, New Orleans can't finish lower than seventh, but it is not in the clear when it comes to avoiding play-in places. Pelicans visit the Warriors Friday, then return home to face uh, the Lakers. Amino Hassan. In studio with us, gentlemen. We brought him in as backup because we don't know if Senior is going to be able to hang on here for the next 20 <laughs> minutes. Go, Joe. What's up? Take it away. Uh, wait a minute. So you guys, wait, we've got this whole studio set up. My dad's over here fumbling around with his headphones, and you guys got a mean stuck over here in the corner with the chair here. I mean, we welcome you into the DraftKings headquarters. We're so excited to have you. They put baby in the corner. This is, uh, look, I was, I was telling Emerson before we came on air, I had no idea. Like, I knew there was a studio and our headquarters was here, but I'd never been. And they keep telling me, hey, man, you got to come up, you got to come up. Like, I, I'll get there eventually. And so we come up here, Charlotte and I, yesterday, and they give us a little tour. And my mind was blown. Mm -hmm. uh, this place is so awesome. I'm like, why weren't we here all year long? Yeah. So I think you guys are going to see a lot more of me around here. Yeah, come hang out, dude. I mean, uh, smells really good this morning, too, guys. I hugged him when he came in the studio. <laughs> Fresh, I, I, really fresh. I, I, I won't lie, when, when you hug me, the first thing I thought of is, how old are the drawers you're wearing right now? Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, just so you know, our friends, our friends at Saks, I have yet to receive the uh, new uh, batch of underwear that is supposedly coming. I am wearing the old blue ones here, gentlemen. Saks, right oh, here. Dear yeah, God. Yeah, get you some of that. Yeah, thanks for bringing that up, I mean. Shout out to Sax. <laughs> I mean, I am so crazy. sorry of your proximity to Emerson Sax right now in this studio here. <laughs> Dad, are, are you back with us? Are you hearing all of this right now? How's this going? I, I am. Can you guys hear me okay or no? Uh, sure. <laughs> yeah. This is it, man. Oh. That's all I got. <laughs> Thank all you, right, man. Well, you know Thank what? It. Dad, we are going to bail you out right now, thankfully, because we've got a mean here. Emerson mentioned we're coming up on the end of the NBA's regular season. Uh, I mean, I know you and Charlotte were in town here. We had the Knicks and Celtics obviously playing last night. And a, a lot of this towards the end of the regular season, uh, I mean, how hard is it to kind of negotiate who's actually going out here and efforting towards winning? Who's just trying to get to the finish line, no matter the seating order here? Like, how difficult is this portion of the season for NBA? teams by and large when you get right up to that finish line okay so in terms of who's playing to win that's not difficult at all they all are because everyone's in flux whether the, you've got teams in the west minnesota oklahoma city and denver fighting for one or teams lower down trying to stay stay out of the play-in move up through the play-in i mean the warriors are at 10 they're looking at like we could get to nine we get to eight if things break our way, so we have to keep going. And the same thing is happening in the Eastern Conference outside of, obviously, Atlanta and Chicago. They're, they're kind of playing by themselves in the corner. But everybody else, the Heat, the Sixers, the Pacers, the Orlando Magic, everyone's kind of engaged in this, trying to move up. The Knicks you mentioned last night, they're trying to move up to two. They've got to win out and hope Milwaukee keeps struggling, which they've been doing. And they can get up to the two seed, which is, would be huge, obviously. Like The Celtics, I think, are the only team that is locked in to their seed and knows exactly where they're going to be. Because even uh, Mavs and Clippers, who are locked into four or five, don't know who four is going to be, who five is going to be. The hard part, Gojo, is who we're going to play. So a lot of NBA playoffs is about matchups. It's about doing intense research for the video staff, for the scouts. Right, like th they're trying to do as much homework as possible for this chess match that's going to take place over four to seven games. That's hard when you don't know who you're going to play. So for those poor scouts and video coordinators, they have to come up with books pretty much for every single opponent they might possibly feed, uh, uh, admit. Oh, <laughs> meet. Wow. Hey, you know what? Listen, end of the regular season for everybody. Understand. Fraud. Didn't it's ask for it's any early, of this, but dude. 
it's it's er, it's early out here too. But no, I, I think you're absolutely right, and I think I, I, that's. Is that the biggest difference, I mean, when it comes to the postseason? We hear players talk all the time about the intensity of playoff basketball, from, but from the back end of this, from the personnel department, certainly from the coaching staff and company, is it just this fact that the game plans you're now putting together are so much more intricate than anything you were doing during the regular season? 1,000%. So typically in the regular season, we're going to play the Celtics tonight, right? So four or five games ago, there's an assistant coach who's charged with scouting the opponent. So he'll watch the last four or five games of the Celtics. He'll come up with the game plans. He's got the play calls from the advanced scouts. The video guys give him some video. The day of the game, we'll watch film as a staff, and then we'll cut that down, and then we'll show the players the cut down version, and then we'll cut that down, and then we'll show the players one more time before we play. We play them. That assistant coach does like a post-mortem, and then we're on to the next one because tomorrow night we've got Milwaukee or Chicago or whoever, and that's the rhythm. When it comes to the playoffs, everybody is focused on one opponent. So your whole staff is scouting. Your whole staff is watching film. We are going through every single strength and weakness of, your oppo of our opponent, and we're going to figure it out because we're going to try and do the things that we like to do, and we're going to try to force them to do the things that they don't like doing. And when you have that kind of focus, including what the players are now watching, only exclusively film of this one opponent, it just brings a higher level of, of preparation to it. And then for the coaches, all that preparation has to come with it. Plan B, plan C, plan D. Those are the adjustments. People always talk about, oh, these coaches make good adjustments during games. That, they didn't come up with it on the fly. We studied this. We came up with multiple contingency plans. If they start doing this, we'll start doing that. And so the best prepared teams, the teams that do a good job of preparation, those are typically the ones that you see doing the best adjustments during the playoffs. I want to get to some of the matchups that you talked about, certainly, that are going to define this postseason and who could potentially be worried about a particular team the most. But while we're coming up on the end of the regular season, I did want to visit on this because I feel like I've heard more conversation lately about the MVP race that for so long seemed like it was Nikola Jokic locked in a corner, already got this sewn up. But the recent tear that Luka Doncic has been on in a season where he's been scoring at a prolific level already – I mean, is there any part of this late season run that's warranted more of a discussion on this award as it pertains to Luka Doncic having a legitimate claim to an MVP caliber season? He, he's played amazing. He's been phenomenal. Uh, his play has risen over the weeks, as you pointed out. He's getting better and better. Having said that, I just think that for the voters, part of it is as a four or five seed, as a lower seed, given that there are other candidates playing on better teams, it's a lot harder to convince them. You got to do something truly remarkable for people to be like, whoa, think about Russell Westbrook when he won his MVP. He did something that no one thought was possible, which was average a triple-double again in this modern era. Now, as it turns out, it's a lot easier. We didn't realize that at the time. So when he did it, it was mind-blowing enough for the voters to say, look, James Harden, I know you had a great season and the Rockets have been amazing, but Russell Westbrook is the pick. Luke has been phenomenal. I don't know if he's been mind-blowingly phenomenal to overcome the seasons that uh, Jokic has had, Shea Gilgis Alexander, Anthony Edwards, uh, Jalen Brunson. Like I think all of those guys are also having great seasons and their teams are doing better. It, that's not a knock on Luka. It's just illustrating how tough the field is. Is this Dallas team capable of making a run in the West? I mean, you mentioned their spot in the seeding and how it's locked into a certain range at this point, but mm -hmm. we feel like we've got seen better production out of them with Kyrie lately since the deadline and since the second half of the season. There's obviously been some improvements for a team that seemed pretty dreadful defensively through the first half of the season. Is this a team now that's actually positioned to potentially make a run? I'll be honest with you, Gojo. The media, we don't get to vote for executive of the year, but Nico Harrison for Dallas, whoever votes on that, I think it's the other execs, he deserves a lot of credit. He went out in the deadline and he made a massive deal. It wasn't a sexy deal that a lead sports show is like, oh my God, the Mavericks got big name blockbuster superstar, but Daniel Gafford and PJ Washington, those are two guys that have been so instrumental to the Mavericks in improved play since basically the trade deadline and since All-Star break. They've been phenomenal. They answered a lot of the questions, filled a lot of the holes they had about their supporting cast, about defense, 
And they've been a lot better. And then you mentioned Kyrie Irving and Luka Doncic, the synergy. They've unlocked a higher level. And this is what Luka's been searching for his entire career. Remember the failed thing with Porzingis. Uh, you go through the years, he just hasn't been a guy who plays well with others. Meaning, I'm not talking about like being a bad teammate, but just finding a way to make the game easier by leaning on someone else. He's been, the ball's in my hands and I do it all. And finally, in Kyrie Irving, he's found a peer. He's found someone to help lift the burden off of him. So when you talk about those two offensively, the two of the most unstoppable individual forces combining to make this offense amazing, and then you uh, supplement that with great defense, great all-round role player, bench play, the Mavericks are for real. Are they going to go to the finals? I'll put it to you like this, Gojo. Every year, like before the playoffs start, I look at – my list of teams that I think have a legitimate chance of going to the NBA Finals so I can book hotel rooms. Because if you wait until it's announced, oh, yeah. you're going to be too late. Either there's going to be no availability or it'll be like $1,000 a night. So I, I get a head start, and guess who's on my list? The Whoa. Dallas Mavericks. I'm booked already. DraftKings will pay for it. All that. right. So, all right. So the, da the Dallas Mavericks are on a means pre-booking NBA Finals list. Who else has made this exclusive club a mean? Okay, so the Boston Celtics have made it. The Minnesota Timberwolves have made it. The Denver Nuggets have made it. The Clippers have made it, or the Lakers, I don't know. I just did LA. <laughs> uh, the Knicks have made it. You know who hasn't made it? This is gonna shock a lot of people. And it's not because I don't think they're good or I see warning signs or whatever. The Oklahoma City Thunder. And the reason for me is I just do not believe that a team that young with zero playoff experience goes to the NBA Finals. It's just too tough of a, of a path. I'm not saying they're going to get knocked out in the first round or anything like that. I'm just saying at some point that lack of experience rears its head. So unfortunately, OKC, I do not have a hotel booking in your town. That's interesting, and I feel like between OKC and a couple other teams, there's some younger squads like that that have come online this year and done really well. I mean, even Minnesota, to an extent, with Anthony Edwards making this huge star turn this year and those Twin Towers pieces and Gobert and Cat finally coming together, I feel like in the West we've been talking about a lot of those teams that have sort of burst onto the scene and elevated themselves in this conversation. So you're saying, Minnesota, would that be the team of, let's say, newcomers-ish that you'd be most comfortable Comfortable betting on going into the postseason? They are the, that's the youngest team on a means short list of NBA Finals possibles. And even then, I, I made the decision that, you know what, I think they can do it for a couple of reasons. Number one, they've been to the playoffs twice now, right? Those guys, the young guys, Cat and Anthony Edwards. They, so they have a taste of what it's like and the preparation, the stuff we talked about earlier, and the heartbreak of when you don't execute, because playoff basketball is all about executing the game plan. When you don't execute, how quickly that thing turns on you. That's part of it. The other part of it is their supporting cast are guys that have been around. You guys like uh, Rudy Gobert and, and Kyle Anderson and Mike Conley. Like, these are vets, dude, who have been in the playoffs, have had all those experiences, know the importance of a possession. So... Like, it's almost like a, uh, like a subsidy of, yeah, we may not know that much, but we've got some guys who know a lot. When you look at OKC, their big vet is Gordon Hayward, who doesn't play often, right? And then everybody else, first time at the rodeo. Shea Gilgis Alexander and, and uh, 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 Josh Giddy and the Jalen Williamses. Like, these guys have never been to the playoffs. And I'm reminded of this story years and years ago when LeBron went back to Cleveland. Right, their first, I wanna say their first game at home was against Chicago, and the crowd is going nuts, obviously, like LeBron's back and we're back to being a great team or whatever, and TNT was there and cameras and every press, and Kyrie, who had never been in the playoffs, leans over to Mike Miller and says, is this what the playoffs are like? And Mike Miller says, no, there's nothing like this. And so that's the thing, like when you're young, even a guy who's been in the league four or five years, you legit have no idea what you're getting into when you go to your first playoff series. I think that makes this postseason really fascinating. I mean, because there's a lot of teams. You look on the Eastern Conference side. Yeah, you've got the Bucks and the Celtics up top there. The Knicks have been in the postseason and have those guys that are tested. But you, you look down at Cleveland, Orlando, Indiana, mm -hmm. these teams that seem like, all right, they're in positions that are a little bit further out ahead. And you've got a lot of teams like Philadelphia, like Miami, and the Western Conference. You've certainly got LeBron and Steph lurking there. Like, how many of these play-in teams, because of that playoff experience, 
experience actually have a chance to maybe make meaningful noise? There are eight playing teams, six of them. Everyone but Atlanta and Chicago. Wow. Atlanta and Chicago just talent-wise, they're not on the same level. Gojo, you and I remember back in our day when we were growing up, you were you fought all year long to be the high seed, the one seed or the two seed. Why? Because you knew at least in the first round, I'm gonna smack up some seven, eight seed team that has no business. They're just happy to be here. Those days do not exist anymore. The seven and the eight seed in both conferences is going to be an incredibly scary team. And it's kind of messed up because you fight all year long to be the one seed. Not only am I getting a real tough opponent, I don't even know who it is until after this week of playing games that's gonna happen next week. It is such a disadvantage. Whereas the three seed, those guys know exactly who they're gonna play. They get to spend that week game planning against the six seed. The one and the two seed don't have that luxury, and then you put, lop onto it. Oh yeah, by the way, we might be playing the Sixers who are here only because Embiid missed half the year. And now he's coming back and he's healthy, and Tyrese Maxey's amazing, and, and they're, they've got a great rhythm, it's like crap. Or I gotta play the Miami Heat, who are an elite defensive team that always seems to turn it on when it comes to the postseason. Or out west, I gotta play either Steph Curry, LeBron James, or Kevin Durant, right? Or it's just insanity in terms of who the possibles are that could come out of the play-in that you're going to be matching up against. It makes life difficult already with the matchup and then with the lack of preparation, you got like a couple of days before you gotta get into it. So with that in mind, how worried should Boston Celtics fans in the East be who are constantly seeing these you know, ghosts of Christmas past about all their recent postseason miscues and the things that have popped up there for a team that's been the most dominant force in the league since the opening tip? Right. So glass half full, you say, well, this isn't your father's Celtics, right? Drew Holiday wasn't here for those mess, mess ups. Uh, Christoph Porzingis wasn't here for those mess ups. Then you say Derek White was here, but... He's so much better of a player than he's, I mean, he, he should be very seriously considered for most improved. I know he's not going to win it because there's a lot of other great names, but the improvement he's made has been incredible. Glass half empty, you know, it's still Tatum and Brown who have to lead this. Like, they're not going to get saved by a supporting cast. Supporting cast can only do so much. They've got to be the ones that make it happen. And then you look and you say, well, crap, either we got to play last year's MVP or we gotta play this one team that every single time we match up, it's a, it's a war. These two teams, the Heat and the Celtics, have met in the conference finals three times already, and the Heat have won twice. So there's a part of this where you're saying to yourself, oh God, not these guys again. But ultimately, the talent gap is sufficient, I think, for the Celtics to feel confident that they can beat anybody in a series. So it, does that extend to the West, I mean? Like, is this still Denver's dance to lose ultimately in the postseason? I, I, I think so. I, I, I hear a lot of people say, and, you know, I, got, I just got done telling you how the Dallas Mavericks are for real, and I believe that they could even go to the finals. But ultimately, everybody seems to have a flaw or a kind of just like a weakness in the armor. Every single team. They all have the ability and the potential to go on magical runs, but for all of them, whether it's, you know, the, the Pelicans, the Suns, the Warriors, the, the Lakers, the Mavericks, the Clippers, the T-Wolves, the, the Thunder. It's all magical. If the Nuggets do it, it's like, yeah, that was supposed to happen. And, and ultimately, it comes back to one thing and one thing only. Who's the best player in basketball? It's that guy. And he never gets hurt and he never gets tired. He plays every game. He plays 30 plus minutes. And as long as he plays Nikola Jokic, there's not much you can do other than hope and pray that something good happens something magical happens it's uh, the dad bod god is my dad if my dad were yeah. able to right now this is where he would say you can't pull fat there's a reason why he's <laughs> never injured is because you go out there and you make it look like that so uh speaking of being bailed out by a supporting cast with all of this technical <laughs> difficulty today amin al hassan absolutely bailing us out making us better today this is why everyone needs to check out oddball him and charlotte wilder although i'd imagine when we get there for the draft i mean you're still going to be there stealing snacks from the studio now. i'm never leaving they don't know this yet but i found a little cubby hole where i could take naps in and stuff like like that oh. i've got plenty of food and drinks emerson big is, man i can help you out i will show you the way dude especially I, with the snack wall get me some sacks as well man <laughs> i need to change the draws <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>
UFC 300 coming your way tomorrow, and DraftKings Network has you covered with everything you need to know about MMA's biggest event of the year. This card is ridiculous, people. The guys on Morning Combat give their insight on UFC 300 starting at 5 o'clock Eastern, and then Anik and Florian go all in on what is sure to be an amazing card. It is, trust me, from Las Vegas at 6 o'clock Eastern. So get your UFC fix starting at 5 o'clock Eastern time on DraftKings Network this Saturday. Baby, that is going to be good. You know what else is good? What's going down at Augusta National right meow, which brings me to Cash It or Trash It, presented by DraftKings. Stay tuned because you'll hear more about DraftKings and all that it has to offer throughout the show. DraftKings, the crown is yours. Gambling problem? Call 1-800-GAMBLER. Age and eligibility restrictions apply. Void where prohibited. See DraftKings.com for details. For this edition of Cash It or Trash It, we're looking at the Masters. We're looking at Masters props here, gentlemen. Bryson DeChambeau, the leader at 7-under. Unbelievable round yesterday, battling Mother Nature, windy conditions. The winner of the Masters has finished in the top 10 on day one in each of the last 18 years, except for Tiger Woods in 2005 and in 2019. Gentlemen, Gojo, I'll start with you because your headphones and your mic are working properly. Are we cashing or trashing? <laughs> cashing or trashing that Bryson could go wire to wire in this one? Plus 550 right now to win. I'm going to trash it. I, I just, I, I want to see him sustain all of this. And you mentioned kind of chaotic circumstances yeah. at Augusta right now. That wind was swirling all day yesterday. You saw the flags on the pins going absolutely nuts, especially towards the end of that round. But a great start for him, no doubt. A guy who, Dad, we remember a couple of years ago when all of a sudden he came out talking cash, you know what, about Augusta in general and how the course would play when he's bombing balls off the tee. And his last couple outings there has gotten humbled incredibly. So his approach approach a lot different this time around. It paid off early in a round where we saw early, and, and that note from Emerson, I want to underscore this again for people. If your name was not Tiger Woods, and shout out to Kyle Porter at CBS Sports is where I saw this. If your name is not Tiger Woods, no one outside of the top 10 after the first day has won the Masters since 2004. So statistically at this point, that group you're looking at right now that includes Max Homa sitting there in second place, Scotty Scheffler at third place there, on and on down the list, if you're outside of that group, chances are you're going to have a bad time for the rest of this weekend, Dad. So are you cashing or trashing this? Well, DeChambeau has always been interesting to watch. It looks like he took powerlifting out of his routine anymore. He's definitely lost some size yeah, there, he did. Uh, which I think he, he feels helps him. I'm trashing this not so much because of Bryson. I trust Scotty Scheffler more to 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 yeah. continue to make the run. His his tee to green has been phenomenal. It had been his putting that had been his nemesis, but that's getting better. So I just trust him more. And I love it because, you know, the old the old uh, line, just like us, you watch this dude. I even heard Scott Van Pelt talking about it when they were doing a highlight of his tee shot there. He was like, don't watch his feet. Don't, don't watch his feet. I mean, his feet are like any hacks feet out there moving all over the place. Yet this dude is the number one player in the world. It gives hope to all yeah. of us that we, we can stuck with our swing or not be fundamentally sound and be good because it's wild to see his feet move the way they do, but the ball just go absolutely where it wants to go. I mean, the dude is a machine. So I am trashing it because I trust him uh, in the next three rounds more than I trust DeChambeau. It's the Scheffler shuffle. That's what we call it in the golf world. But it's awesome. interesting when you compare the two. DeChambeau just looked like, you know, he was pounding balls and it looked like he was really working hard to get to that seven under number. And then you watch Scheffler and it is the most quiet, effortless looking six under at Augusta that I have ever seen. And again, a lot of the guys in the afternoon yesterday, once the rain ripped through, they were dealing with some crazy wins. So to see him shoot that in those crazy wins was even more impressive. Just so low key. It's like we're not even really embracing how good of golf we've seen him play, historical golf we've seen him play over the past year because we're just so used to it now.
I, I'm sorry. I stopped really listening after you said that's what we in the golf world call the Scheffler shuffler. Yeah. yeah. The shuffle. This this is this is you're in the golf world. Absolutely. You're, you're the main one of the mainstays in the golf world I'm now. A, I'm a gorgeous golf guru. People come to me for inappropriate golf memes on Twitter day in and day out. Oh God. Okay. Yeah, Emerson seems most likely to go the Chubbs Peterson. It's all in the hips route of golf <laughs> yeah. tutorials. Yeah, when, when you guys are here, somebody swing. When you guys are here in a couple weeks for draft week, senior, I'll teach you how to do it. All right, we'll do the all in the okay. hips thing. I got you, big daddy. I Every, look forward to we'll it. Have, Thank <laughs> you. I look forward to the HR meeting that we're all in coming <laughs> oh, up I'm after tight this. With them. But Don't worry. I, <laughs> I, I, that I have no doubt. Uh, you mentioned, though, Dad, the confidence in Scotty Scheffler. Well earned. And Emerson, I think, underscored in the conditions yesterday to go out there and cart a round that was entirely bogey free on the first day. And I believe only missed two fairways in regulation the entire first round. It was something absurd like that. And we know, again, like you said, T to Green, that had been the stat for him coming into this tournament. The shots gained from T to Green, he had been absurd. And so you've got that, a player that we knew coming in was the best that's well positioned to do this and on the other side like a lot of hope for all of us on the tiger woods front coming through the first day yeah. now that comes with a caveat though because tiger woods was one of the groups that got an especially late start because of the weather yesterday and so while tiger sits right now at even par through 17 holes of his first round that first round is still going on today. Tiger is ultimately going to end up having to play, I believe, 23 holes yep. today between the end of his first yeah. round and then the entirety of his second round. And, Dad, for a guy where injury is the main concern, an older guy, the weather's still a factor, this is one of the absolute worst things I think could have happened for what felt like a very promising start. He was one under through nine yesterday, still sitting at even now, well within range of making the cut, which is what we all hope, but a major worry based on what we know yeah. physically he's up against now. And, and that's the thing with Tiger. Every time he golfs, right, it's going to be what's the weather like? What's the situation like? How is it going to be for him walking? Because you see that slight limp as it goes and does it get worse and worse? Uh, so I, I, I'm with you. I mean, we talked about this yesterday. I, I did not want to trash it of him making the cut, but I did. With my heart, I wanted him to make it. But with my head, if I'm putting some cheddar on this, I, 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 I trash this. And I, and I hope I'm wrong. I hope I'm wrong. If Me he can too. stay at even, if he can stay at even, what what uh, Deschambeau is at seven under, so he's seven back. I mean, he's he's in position to make the cut without question. But to your point, Mike, you're right. I mean, to finish your first round again, what went into last night? Finishing late, how much rehab does he get in right after that? Then how much sleep does he get before he gets back out? Before he has to go walk on that foot, that ankle, that knee, that back. You know, and how that will affect him. So, you're, you're no matter what, all eyes are on him, and I really do hope he makes the cut. That's a complete separate story from what we're talking about at the top of the leaderboard. He's grinding right now for par on 18, and then guys, he'll tee off at 10, 18. So <laughs> here in 58 minutes, oh, 48 wow. minutes, whatever, whatever, the, 48 yeah. minutes here from from now. But I think the important yeah. thing, he checked most of the boxes for me yesterday through 13 holes. So the guy's swing what looked smooth for the most part, had a really saucy looking short game, tons of saves in tough situations. And the most <clears> important <throat> thing is he did look healthy. Now, I'm not getting too excited about it because 23 holes today grinding on that course. This is not an easy yeah. course to navigate yeah. around. But the weather looks good the rest of the way. <laughs> it's not like a cold downpour like last year when he couldn't finish the weekend. Yeah, I think, Dad, that's the one thing I think people who haven't been there, and certainly I'm among, not among that group, but hearing about it from others, way hillier than I think it gets credit for in a lot of people's oh, yeah. eyes in terms yeah. of navigating that mm -hmm. from Tiger's perspective. I, I think his his job to make the cut obviously just got tougher. I mean, this isn't, this isn't rocket science. It's a guy whose body is beat up, is now asked to play 23 holes, finish the first round and play a, a, a you know, not even an hour later. So in my opinion, the deck is stacked against him physically. Even if the swing was looking good, he was feeling good. You know, all of that can go out the window when physically you just aren't there and what it starts to do to your round and to your swing. So well, you, you said the right word, Emerson, grinding. I think he is going to yeah. be grinding all day long just to make the cut. Stamina is going to be key. So it's a good thing he gave up sex during his master's prep. Okay. Oh, God. It's true. See? Exactly.
So now he's plus one through the first 18. He's got time for some oh, orange slices, a juice box, and then we get Tiger oh, back oh, out boy. on the course for another round mm. at Augusta. All right, welcome back to Gojo and Goal. Mike Gold Jr. and Mike Golick Sr. here. And spring football going on in a variety of different ways right now. You've obviously got a bunch of great colleges back out there getting their 15 practices in right now before everyone gets sent home for a little bit of summer break. But we've also had the UFL going on right now, the combined XFL and USFL getting together under the tutelage of The Rock, trying to give a bunch of guys a great opportunity. And for more on that and the general state of things in the world of football, pumped to have our guy Jake Butt back on uh, with the program with us former great Michigan tight end, now doing a great job on color uh, over the Big Ten Network and at the UFL, Jake. So uh, good morning, man. How, how's this been so far for you through the first couple of weeks of this season where these two former spring leagues merged into one trying to give guys that crack at it? it it's It's been awesome. Uh, I'm curious. I, I feel like there's an appetite for football. I don't know that anyone will ever be full on football here in America. Uh, I certainly won't. If, if it's on TV, I'm tuning in. And and you're exactly right. Like th- you're giving guys a chance. There's some great stories. And yet, like the conversation, I think is changing. And by the end of the year, it will change. Once the two leagues merged, I, I think you could start to say, "Man, you have some really good football being played now." Like the rosters are twice as good. They're twice as deep. You know, it's the early part of the season, so I I think defenses usually do have that advantage. It's more reactionary earlier in the season. But once the offenses have a chance to figure out their identity and get some chemistry going, I mean, 
my first game was Michigan versus the St. Louis Battlehawks, and it started slow to be expected. But those last two, three minutes were really explosive, really fun. And then we saw like a 64-yard field goal get hit as a game winner, and the crowd was going nuts. So, you know, I think what we, the America – their trust was broken with the spring league starting up and then stopping and then starting. What you're now seeing is some consistency with, which allows fan bases to grow. Uh, To me, it's awesome. And I'm glad we have it. So listen, uh, me, all of us are, because we're the only sport that doesn't have that true minor league, right? All the other sports have a number of ways they can grab other talent. The football did not have that or hasn't had anything that's been sustainable outside of NFL Europe, which the NFL owned, and then, you know, realized this isn't a good money thing for us and stopped. So, Jake, while all that is true, I agree with everything you said. We all know what's the sustainability. And it's just a matter of how much money is The Rock and the other owners willing to lose over a number of years before they see if this thing hits. And when I say hits, I mean start a partnership with the NFL. Do you see that in the future for the UFL? Because that's the way it's going to survive. Oh, I, I think that's that has to be long-term vision. I believe that is their long-term vision. And, and really, you know, the 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 minor league is college football, right? It like that, yeah. and college football Saturday, right. yeah. NFL Sunday, and and what this league does, you know, it reminds me. You know, when Jim Harbaugh came to Michigan, uh, like one of his first ever team meetings, he would tell us, he's like, hey, you know, we'd have four hour practices. You know, some teams would have an hour and a half of meetings and two and a half hour of practices. He got rid of the hour and a half of meetings because he told us, hey, if you want to get better at playing football, then you play more football. So what when it's a little bit of quieter time in the year, uh, obviously no college football. I know OTAs are going to be starting back up soon. These guys are playing ball. They're get bet. They're getting better at playing football in a competitive, fun league. Uh, and and to your point, you know, long term, I think the NFL is is they can always move slowly, but do they see this as an asset? Do they see this as a long term partnership? That would be huge for the league to get that credibility. Uh, and and again. I believe we have a few years of runway here, right? Like you talk about, I, I believe there is significant investment. The numbers have come about, uh, come about positively. You look at the attendance in, in some of the cities when they're up against opening weekend in the MLB, you got the end of the women's and men's college basketball tournament. The numbers are very encouraging. Yeah, I I think you're right. All the signs seem to be pointing in a positive direction. You look now, I mean, you've got direct proof of concept from the old XFL with the kickoff that's now going to be implemented in the National Football League. They looked and they found immediate utility that's going to go into practice this season in the NFL where what you're watching now in the Spring League is going to be exactly the thing that you're seeing on Sundays this upcoming fall. So I'm with you on that, Jake. I think seeing that, I'd have to imagine inside this circle for the UFL has gone a long way in making everyone feel bolder and better about what the situation is. Well, I, I I encourage people to watch it because there's a few things that should be implemented right now. They like have a they have a live tracker in the football, so they you don't right. need to measure the sticks. Yes, we're we're all sitting here as football guys. Like, come on, let let let's get this going. Right, it's time it's time to modernize the game. Uh, I also love like you know. <laughs> You get the live replay with your head rules analyst who's walking you through what the call is in real time. And, uh, you know, from what I've read with fans, they love that and appreciate yep. uh, like those are those are two things that I think fans would absolutely embrace day one. And again, the NFL has the advantage as an established powerhouse league. They can move slowly. So do you partner with the UFL in, in that sense to try to see what the future, the game's changing. We we know this, the game's changing. So could you partner with the UFL to still move slowly and see what might work in your league? So I, I'm wondering, Jake, what you think the percentage is of players who are trying to make it to the NFL and players that know they're not going to make it there, but know that they can continue their dream of playing. That's a that's a great question. And I think there's, you know, 
there's a good there's there's probably a handful of guys on each roster that realistically could be on practice squads right now at a minimum, right? Like that, that, that there's there's you're you're chasing small percentages the higher up you go. Like the the difference in the NFL is very very small uh, for like the back half of the roster, the bottom half of the roster, the practice squad guys. So I do believe there's a handful of dudes on each every single roster in the league that could have practice squad uh, talent, and then. I think there's, to your point, I think there's a few stories that what we'll see is guys have been able to revitalize their career. Maybe they get that practice squad opportunity from what they've shown in the UFL, and then they actually can make a roster. A.J. McCarron was on the sidelines for the Bengals last year. Of course, he's the best quarterback, probably the best player in the league. He's a stud. Uh, and and that, that's the next step for this league, too, is, you know, the UFC needed Conor McGregor. You know, to to really explode the league, it's marketing. Uh, I don't know that they have a Conor McGregor right now, but the more that they can have stories to grow and showcase and and tell the world about who they are, the better they'll be served. So you guys can check out Jake as a part of the great UFL coverage on Fox, doing an awesome job broadcasting the opportunity for these guys. We've only got about a minute left with you, Jake, so I want to get this in here. Your alma mater, J.J. McCarthy, I think has been the big story of draft season so far in the lead-up. Has any part of the coverage of him surprised you in the way that pro people are talking about this national champion quarterback? Pro people, no, because it seems like pro people are being grounded and realistic and saying, wow, you know, this guy can do everything we want our quarterback to do. And, and, you know, you try to, like, draw a circle around the potential of what your quarterbacks can do. And, you know, Drake May, Jaden Daniels, uh, Caleb Williams, their highlight tapes might be 20 minute long of, of full, full, sexy, beautiful plays. JJ's might only be 12 or 13 because, you know, he didn't play in a bunch of shootouts. But everything that those guys can do, JJ has shown he's capable of doing, just maybe not the volume of it. And what what I know you guys know this to be true is is there was a, a scout came out and showed a scouting report talking about J.J. McCarthy as like a 16-year-old in high school going to Michigan. And he was telling other recruits that, hey, if you want to chase girls or party, don't come to Michigan. We're here to win. That's a 16-year-old at the time telling that when Michigan was struggling, they were very much yeah. struggling at that time. That's leadership. That's competitiveness. That's ownership of your craft. And then that sets high expectations and he exceeded him at Michigan. Like, again, he's got the physical traits. I think that's that's the piece that's uh, making people really excited about JJ. It's that off-field character leadership aspect. No doubt the intangibles seem to be a big part of the cell and the package there. Uh, Jake, can't thank you enough, man, for the time. Really appreciate it. Congratulations. I know you got a wedding coming up, man. Looking forward to that. Looking forward to talking to you again soon, brother. Always good to see you guys. Thanks.
right, guys, time to finish off the show the way we always do. This, that, and the third. Three quick stories to send you off into the rest of your day. As always, make sure you download, subscribe, rate, review us, leave us a five-star rating, and check us out live Monday through Friday from 8 to 10 a.m. Eastern when you can here on DraftKings Network. You can catch the best of Gojo and Golo from noon to 1 p.m. Eastern with our great lineup over at VEASAN, wherever you hear them on the radio, or if you miss it in any of those spots here, or our great guests. And we had a bunch of them today. Thank you to former Major League pitcher Rob Dibble, who stopped by today, our buddy Amin El Hassan from Oddball. <laughs> with Charlotte Wilder here on the DraftKings Network, and Jake Budd, who just stopped by, former Michigan tight end, doing a great job covering ball over at the Big Ten and the UFL on Fox. If you missed any of that, catch it wherever you get your podcasts or right here on YouTube as soon as we get done with the show. Uh, Dad, let's get to this and start off. On the NFL front, new news the other day with the lids. Two years after alternate helmet designs were approved to return to the NFL, the league's expanded its uniform policy to allow for a third helmet to be added to each team's uniform closets. The league announced Wednesday with a memo here. I love this stuff, Dad. We always talked about this relative to our alma mater at Notre Dame. Every year, we would do uh, the Shamrock Series game where we'd get a different helmet. It was something new, and the traditionalists hated it, but we sit around there wearing the same uniforms all the time, seeing other people have that fun. And so to get to go and kind of explore that possibility is awesome. And now for NFL teams who have taken some more liberties, who have a bunch of the old school helmets you can draw on here, I love this little variety they've added into things. Absolutely love it. I, I'm just amazed at the amount of people that complain. I mean, they just see something a little bit different and they think it's the worst thing in the world. I love it. And sometimes are they going to be misses? Yeah. Sometimes are you, you're going to strike out instead of hitting the home run? Yeah. But I love the attempt. Absolutely. I, I think they should allow different versions of uniforms as well as helmets. You know, mix it up a little bit. It can only help memorabilia because people will go out and buy that stuff as well. So I'm all for this. I am all for trying different variations. As we said, third helmet here, but I would just even say different variations of uniforms. I am, I am all cool with that. I love when colleges do it. I think we can all agree, though, on the NFL front, Emerson. The only helmet we don't want to see back is that Jacksonville gradient wow. helmet that went from, like, teal to black front to oh, back. Yeah. That was an abomination. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, it's an absolute abomination. What I want to see is, and I told you guys during the break, the Jags, their first logo that you couldn't even use, literally looked like the Jaguar, the car logo on their helmet, was looked like it was leaping off the helmet. It's pretty damn sick. They couldn't use it because Jaguar was like, no, 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 not so fast, my friend. <laughs> Sued the hell out of the team, which is why the Jags ended up going with the logo that they did. They've changed it a few times. But yeah, the lo the helmet you are mentioning, Gojo, not a fan of. Not a fan of at all. But no. I was not a hater of the mustard uniforms for Color Rush. I actually wasn't. Blake Bortles looks so sexy in that thing. <laughs> Huge Color Rush fan here. You're never going to get any pushback from me on that. What I think the NFL needs to do and what teams need to do, hire out the people that do all these Photoshops and edits on Twitter of these helmets. We have handed a generation of people Photoshop and all of these different tools for so long that they've weaponized them in a way that's incredible content online. We see the NFL always engaging with it. Give those people the power to create the helmets of tomorrow, Dad. And also, like I said, even the uniforms, the only caveat, do not let anybody mess with the uniforms in the NFL uh, of the people that are doing the uniforms in baseball. Keep them away. Keep yeah. them away. Fanatics, get, the, get out of here. Yeah. Stay away <laughs> from our sweet NFL yeah. uniforms here. There's so, already enough yeah. swamp ass on NFL offensive linemen. We don't need help from your sweaty jerseys. What do you mean? We don't want see-through pants? Speaking. We don't want see-through pants in the oh. NFL? Oh. God, no. no, we don't. We don't. You don't. <laughs> oh. You don't want to open up that can of worms, my no, brother. Speaking no. of can of worms, though, Emerson, let's open up one with Tom Brady, who's already getting itchy uh, and bored at home this offseason. Yeah, wow. he is. Like the bajillion dollar TV contract is supposed to start in the Fox booth here next season. He's not thinking of that. He's potentially reconsidering returning to football, and we have a clip to back me up on this statement. Let's say one day there's a situation, right? Maybe it's the 49ers, maybe, you know, heading to the playoffs, offense is great. Patriots, somebody, could be somebody, somebody, Raiders, somebody, could be, you never know. God forbid somebody goes down, would you pick up that phone? I'm not opposed to it. If they would, I don't know if they're gonna let me if I become an owner in the NFL team, but I don't know if, uh, I don't know, I'm always gonna be in good shape, always be able to throw the ball, so. To come in for a little bit, like MJ coming back, um, I don't know if they let me, but I wouldn't be opposed to it. 
Oh, let him play. I don't care so that he's that an owner. Let him Tom, play. Tom Brady on the yeah. Deep Cut yeah. podcast, which I think is a part of his Shadow Lion production yeah. company. He's in the barbershop chair getting cut up while yeah. this is yeah. going on. And Dad, I think later on in the interview, he also said he's kind of focused on the here and now, and he mentioned all these other things he has going on, but he does seem like a guy based on his current life situation and the way that he left the game. I would not be stunned at all if come November, we're going to have this conversation dominating first take at some point of who needs to pick up the phone and call Tom. Would not shock me one bit. This is a guy who for the last 50 years has had something to do during the football season is his first year not. Uh, so I, I can see that thought process. He says he keeps himself in shape. He's always going to be able to throw a football. So I could see that happen. And so Greg Olson, keep warmed up in the bullpen, man, because they'd be yeah. tapping that right arm at some point later on in the season, putting you back up to the number one slot where you have done a phenomenal job. But this, this is one of the least shocking things I've heard in a while. Yeah, I, I would agree. Maybe Greg Olson will be the one leaking to the media. Oh, yeah, such and yeah. such team has been linked to Tom Brady <laughs> coming up here right now. We should give him the space to explore this option and see what happens there. Uh, Emerson, oh, Dad, go ahead. What do you got? I was going to say, think about that, though. Think about if you are a contending team and you do have your quarterback go down, that there is actually Tom Brady who has proven he can still play sitting there possibly waiting to come off the sidelines. Yeah. I mean, when, when when we saw it this past year, grabbing guys off the couch like a Joe Flacco and what they've come in and been able, some have been able to play pretty well. Think of Tom Brady, who's barely been out of the game, coming back of how much he can help your team. Yep. Yep. You called that God, least, least God shocking. God help us all. Least shocking information ever. Yeah. But what about, what about what we have here for the third, Gojo? <laughs> I can't tell you if I'm super shocked about this news. Jerry Turner, Teresa Ness, you know, the first golden bachelor couple here, less than two months uh, after their engagement was revealed. That was back in November. They tied the knot on television. So today, I believe it was, they had an announcement to make to the world. Teresa and I have had a number of heart-to-heart -heart conversations and we've looked closely at our situation, our living situation and so forth. And, and we've kind of come to the conclusion mutually mm -hmm. that it's probably time for us to um, dissolve our marriage. Get a divorce. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yes. Three months after getting married. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Living situation. He wanted the top bunk and she wouldn't give it to him. No. Dad, I see you doing your shock Tell face. Tell me it isn't shock. Tell me it isn't so. <laughs> no way. Stop it. Tell me that people who have been on a show for a few weeks, <laughs> that their lives together didn't pan out. Tell me the one thing we've been talking about all along. These two are so entrenched in their lives that someone would have to move away from their family that they would be okay with it. Tell me it didn't happen. Tell me it didn't happen. Tell me that Jerry didn't get found out to be a bit of a dog after everybody <laughs> fell in love with this guy. Tell me this didn't happen. And I got a whole lot of area to sell you in a swampland. These shows oh. are stupid. These shows are stupid. Uh. We get caught up in them. You know somebody for 12 weeks and you're going to marry them. All the bachelors and bachelorettes we got and how many marriages have stuck. I mean, you could count it on one hand. They're a joke, and I get forced to watch it every time with your mother. <laughs> it's incredibly compelling theater. The it Golden is. Bachelor was a revelation in a franchise that needed a little bit of added life, and albeit got uh. it from people that were much, much older. But you're right. A lot of the, the edge. This would have been much more devastating to people before the article and the revelation about some of the stuff from Jerry's recent past. And so this is, I think, less of an aw, darn moment and more of a, yeah, we kind of saw this coming now, much like a lot of the rest of the franchise. True love is dead. I have nothing <laughs> to believe in anymore. Sorry, Mom. I don't know if it's going to work out. We hope it works out for ah. you and us, though. Download, subscribe, rate, and review this show and our relationship. Have a great weekend. We'll talk to you guys Monday.